Hello. Welcome. So, I'm sorry I started a couple minutes late here. Uh, it's been an exciting day and I needed a moment to de-stress after coming home. Uh, out for Yule time activities, we ended up with a flat tire and had to wait for a little bit to get it pulled off and the car back on the road. It was fun. Uh, but I did make it back in time, just needed to breathe a bit. Hello? Beard Buchanan. And the Woodbine Witch, hello! Yes, I mean, you know, as travel crises go, as I've said before, uh, sometimes Hermes helps by avoiding those troubles, sometimes he helps them from being a real crisis. At least I discovered that it was uh, popped while we were parked, and not while we were driving at high speeds. So, there's that. My thanks. <laughs> oh... Well, other than that, uh, today was icing cookies, seeing a little bit of the park downtown, although it was raining today, and stopping off at a local pagan store. So, pretty good otherwise, other than that little bit of crisis. All right, now we've got some people trickling in. Welcome, welcome. Um, I'll get started here soon with the plans for tonight. For those who might be coming in new and don't know, I usually use my lives to share material, uh, some of it older that I haven't gotten put out or it's longer than fits on TikTok, some of it brand new. In fact, the first thing I'm going to do tonight is a song that I just finished with the writing last night and I'm pretty settled on the tune, uh, but it is brand new. So you'll be the first to hear it on any public media other than my long suffering and much understanding wife. Uh, I've also got planned a couple of shorter form poems, but still a couple minutes rather than one minute. I uh, have a poem that's been published, but just once and not somewhere that pre prevents me from presenting it here. Uh, some more mythology poetry that I've talked about before, the new myths, uh, stories from classic mythology that actually weren't there, but could have been. And then I have two stories tonight. And there's actually an overlap. Uh, one of these stories is actually a poem, another published piece called Stolen Thread, which is a epic poem telling a new myth. And then uh, another allegory type fable story that I'll share at the end. So, uh, in general, also, I welcome requests. If I can dig up a piece that you've heard before or a type of thing that you might want to hear, um, I tend to have things about a great many different deities and mythological figures. Uh, and certainly uh, questions. If you have questions, unless I'm right in the middle of something, uh, then I'll catch it right after whatever I'm reading or reciting. Okay. We'll get started. So the brand new song, uh, one that I actually had started the pieces of three months ago, I had a number of ideas for lyrics, but they weren't quite meshing together. And I sat down last night and got it hammered into a pretty good shape. Because of that, I haven't had time to memorize it, so I'll cheat off of my, my paper copy here. Uh, the song's called, I Like to Write It Wrong. I Like to Write It Wrong. Let's see if I can get the beat. I like to write it wrong, I like to let the devil lead. I give him rope until he chokes, so don't trust all you read. Now the devil needs no advocate, he speaks just fine alone. But most don't catch the words, he says, they just hear what they want. I might howl the quiet parts, the devil twists my tongue. He'll let me rest if I confess the evils mankind's done. I like to write it wrong, I like to read the lines between. I put my heart out in the dark so hidden things get seen. Some claim they paint in shades of gray by mixing bright and dull. I'd rather spread the whole palette, all colors of the world. I might sing the offbeat notes, the trickster twists my tongue. He'll grant relief from all his grief if I pretend he's one. I like to write it wrong, I like to poke in all the holes. 
I find much more in foreign ports than all the docks I've known. Yes, I may put my rod foot first in case it gets cut off, so the fools can take the bit they like and leave the rest for us. I may speak unspeakables, the trickster twists my tongue. The things I say are only play until one day they're not. I like to write it wrong, I like my humor gallows black. I pin my verse when things are worse, though it takes some aback. The Puritans, they say I'm lost, the sinners say I'm soft. The one thing they agree on is to pray that I'll shut up. I might laugh at epitaphs, the reaper twists my tongue. I share that grin with Mr. Grimm until my song is done. I don't know why that one turned into country folk as I was writing, but that's what it decided to be. Hope you enjoyed, and welcome to those who arrived during the song. I figured that also works as a good general disclaimer. I almost want to put that at the beginning of each of my lives just to say, warning. Uh, because I have a great many uh, poems and songs that start off parodying something. Uh, I'm pretending or making mockery of some point of view. Like last live, I uh, debuted a song called Love and Light, uh, which is a song about toxic positivity. So it starts out about, you know, we only want the positive, no negatives we hear. That's not me talking. That's what I'm satirizing or parodying. Uh, so the idea, that's where that came from. I like to write it wrong. Don't trust all you read. I've had problems with that sometimes in TikTok when people hear the first part is the more negative or uh, controversial part and they, they click off. They don't want to hear the rest. I've learned better, you know, get that hook in so that people actually pay attention. All right. Uh, thank you, Star. Welcome, Introvertigus. Introvertigus. I like that name. It's like my business name, Luminathan, is a pun in there. Okay, so the second piece I wanted to share tonight is the one that I mentioned has been published before uh, in a magazine called Oak Leaves. That's the print magazine of a druidic order that I'm a part of, Arndrock Fane. And everything that's published in there is no rights reserved. It can be published elsewhere. So I give them a lot of mythological and bardic works, um, and including some short stories that they've published. This poem is also a riddle. Uh, so for anyone who's familiar with their Greek mythology, um, I'm reading from the perspective of a particular character. It shouldn't take you long, but see how, how many verses I get before you guess who this poem's about. And feel free to share your guesses in the comments. Uh, or hold them until the end, see if you can figure it out. The poem is called Sarpedonis. I left behind an honored job in high and holy place, retreating to a refuge where I thought I might be safe. With sisters new, in solitude, I sought to stro start a garden, but all it grows are foolish bows, rejected, cold, and hardened. Once I was a treasure, men and gods once sought to lay me. Now that I'm a monster, men by gods are sent to slay me. I offer them a warning hiss whenever they land near, to tell them only poison kisses wait for those too near. And some do come no closer, purely petrified by fear, but older, others, bold or foolish, seek to brave my stony stare. They bring me gifts, bright metal things, perhaps they think me vain. True, I once boasted of my looks, a glowing golden train. But soon I knew that beauty drew less virtue and more beasts, and by the time I'd learned the worst, the horrid truth cut deep. So save your mirrors and maneuvers. I'm a calloused hag. I know there's other reasons that you want me in your bag. Still, if I find your cause persuasive, I might take a fall. If only so my children might be freed of my exile. I've been hard harmed and armored by the fate's uncaring work, but they'll be golden, glorious, as I was once before, free to fly and free to love. Perhaps they'll be good friends. Yes, even to the God-blessed fool who brings me to my end.
That is Sarpedonis, a poem about... Any guesses? Actually, I'll show you the illustration in a minute here. That is a poem about Medusa. And the illustration is actually a stonework mosaic I created a while back, the Shield of Athena, which has the head of the Gorgon, the head of uh, Medusa on it. So I like to write those uh, poems where it's presented from the perspective of the character who generally do doesn't get their voice. And there have been more modern works that look at things how Medusa might have felt, how the Cyclopes felt about having this group of people invade their island and then blind him. It was terrible. Not always the villains, either. Uh, last show, I shared one uh, poem called Cautionary, which was uh, Icarus speaking from the afterlife after his unfortunate fall. All right. Next one I wanted to share is another poem, a short poem. It is leaning toward the more uh, punk part of my title, Bardic Punk. Uh, a little bit political, a little bit topical. Uh, I tend to write these to express a point of view. You've maybe heard a few on my TikTok channel, the ones that are less mythological in nature. This poem is called A Variety of Offenses. The word offend is overused. To say offended draws abuse. There's better words that we can use to highlight bad behavior. When words or deeds are causing harm, then be specific, name the fault, the wound, to body, head, or heart that's caused by said offender. Distinguish speech that's dangerous from vulgar words that just discussed by calling out the consequence if harmful talks accepted. It's not about how people feel, but what those words create as real. What is said can hurt and kill. Rebuttals are defensive. When words deny humanity, treating people like mere things, left unchallenged, that can lead to misery and murder. Similarly, there's bigotry, prejudice and biases, ignorant inaccuracies that justify abuses. Some words curse with cruelty while some deliberately deceive, meant with malice to mislead and serve an unkind purpose. Others are just stupid twits, wasting time with worthless wind, warping language, twisting wit, which weakens valid reason. Some are calls to violence, giving license to bad acts, telling those who might hold back their nastiness has sanction. Often couched in cultish lies like propaganda and false pride, claiming awful acts are right and damning opposition. Don't let them argue tolerance as if their words are mere beliefs. Specify the true offense against specific persons. It's not hard to bring examples where mere words got victims trampled. Don't let righteous fire be dampened while verbal damage worsens. I still got some people watching. I haven't lost you. Yay. <laughs> I kid about that a lot, but I do sometimes think uh, people hear enough of that on their, their Twitter feed and on their Facebook and so forth. But that's my response often when I hear those things. Like another poem, there was one, uh, Give and Take, was about not being a knee-jerk reaction to everything that you hear. This one, words have importance, words have meaning. And I'm not saying that just as a, a linguist, a scholar, a teacher, a writer, a poet occasional songwriter, someone for whom words are all, you know, all my work. But mm, I say that as reality, that words do things. Otherwise, we wouldn't even bother talking. So next time someone tells you it's just words, you can say, not that you're offended, but what damage that those words use or those words cause. All right. Uh, I haven't seen any requests. Let's see. Some ins and outs and backs and forths. Uh, hello again to anyone who just came in. Who's that? Libinslow. Hello. The next piece that I have planned for tonight 
is the one I mentioned is a epic poem. And that's meant in two ways. First, it is a longer poem. It is a story. It's another new myth, in this case in Norse mythology, about the god Hermod, one of the sons of Odin, one that gets the least billing, I think, uh, also known as Hermod the Swift, repeatedly the fastest of, of among the Aesir, and Odin's messenger. Uh, Hermod is mentioned briefly in a few different myths, including the uh, death of Baldr, Baldr the Bright. That's where this story picks up, is after he's gone out to, to hell, to the afterlife, to ask uh, for her to release the dead Baldr. So that's the background of that, um, get you into the myth a little bit. And it's also an epic in that it's written in a Norse epic style, a very specific uh, variety of skaldic poetry. Uh, if you listen, you may notice it's six lines per stanza, six, six syllables per line with the alliteration and in rhyming that's characteristic of that style. So just a little poetry talk before I get into it. <laughs> So, this is Stolen Thread, a new mythology story of the god Hermud. Sing a secret saga, unknown until today, of Odin's boy I speak, windswift and battle brave, slept near rider, Hermod, and how he robbed the Norns. After hailing Hell's halls, after Baldur's pallor, after guesting in grief, Hail Hermuth held horror, not of death or defeat, but of being forgot. Deeds and daring had Baldur, brightness, beauty, even Laufey's son, as the Allfather's fickle friend, warranted well would be fight destructive deeds. What of their swift sibling? Though fierce fell, fine and fair, his story seldom soared. No errant adventure was he allowed apart, writing Rognir's errands. Thus would he do, till death, should duty drear demand. Hermuth upheld honor, obedient unto doom, bound by noble bearing, which was his word, and weird. Duty doomed, rolled, rode Helvegger, oh, excuse me, Duty doomed rode Hermod, reversed upon Helvegger, bringing grave gifts to some, bearing grave words to Frigg, heading home with Hell's laugh, slowed by thoughts serpentine. Would he be hailed hero for his daring descent? Would he be set aside in heedless haste, unthanked, with all Asgard abroad, begging brine for Balder? Instead, the swift sun chose, while slept near speed he shared, to turn down and descend toward world trees' wide roots to the lair at land's end, where sisters three weave weird. Never again might he be free to fare so far. Never again might he wander away unwatched to find fate's fell forgers to ask them what he would. At first he solely sought to ask an accounting, but then... Drawing inward, the streams snaking slowly round Yggdrasil's great base, Hermod improved his plans. Was he not swift, and stout, and wary, and war-skilled? Did he not steer Slepnir, swallow swift and steady? Why not? Why simply see his skein, when he could claim its coil? In ill-advised ideas came Hermod to the cave, howling his own herald, Hailing, walking inward, playing petitioner to those who dwelt within. Sisters three, I attend from Asgard to your door, ahead of Frigg's command, bringing word, begging woe, Baldur's held in Helheim's halls, till all lament his loss. Answered they as thousands, three and one. This we know, and into sight they stepped, women of wide shadow, intimidating tall giants of three ages. Said stern Hermod, 
I see, and I ask your answer. Will you weep for Balder? Answered old Erd, assured, are there any alive who would not wail that wound? Still she smiled as she shed tears from ancient eyes. A knowing nod she shared with Verdandi, weaving on, straight-faced, also sobbing. Even eyeless Skuld cried. Sisters, thanks, said Hermoth. I will bear back your boon. But as I fared so far, a second gift I beg. To view my weird and weave, a feat few have achieved. The eldest gave consent, smiling still. The bidmost pondered patter patterns turning, then agreed. The youngest stayed her shears a second, then spoke, It shall be seen. Earth teased the thin thread that spanned the single soul. Verdandi traced its track, showing where it wound. Silent schooled sat sullen, unneeded to divide. Lightning leapt, thus aligned, quickest in all nine worlds, faster even than fates, snatching up his spindle, freeing it from the fear of those life-bleeding blades. She who ends all called out, Stop, thief, or suffer worse. But what is worse than her? From the cave Hermod fled, leaping eight-legged Slepnir, racing up and away. Heart beating, breath heaving, racked with wonder that he should seek such and succeed unlike any other, Hermod held his own weird, to wind and we weave as wished. Would he boast his boldness, a deed none other dared, never before and never after? Or should he stay silent, concealing his conquest, invincible, immortal? His reward would wait. First, to free fair Balder, delivering Hell's deal. Before himself, Hermuth held his interred kinsman, hoping for his return. Thank you, Dick. To Asgard's door he rode, unannounced, unchallenged, as if his homecoming were worth no welcome word. Were all so sorrow-sunk that none in kinship came? Into Frigsfane he fared, revealing his return, announcing his success. No heavy head yet turned, sullen Aesir yet snored, deep in dreams, cups, and cares. Fighting flaring fury, their crier crossed the aisle, mouthing his mother's name, barking his brother's names, damning the doorsman, doorman's name, that none should pay him heed. Even gold-toothed Heimdall, furthest seer, sharp-eared, seemed senseless, still staring, even when nose to nose. Patience passed, Roth Hermoth raised hands and struck to rouse. Like blood from ice rebounds, without hit, without heed, his target untouched. Odin's son struck again, harmless, like the stones thrown at oath-warded Balder. Seeing nothing serving, the rider reigned his rage, imagining enchantments, magic which might explain this strange state of Asgard, as Aesir drowned senseless. While thus in thought there came laments from Mother Frigg, addressed to those within, Where is one warrior to fare forth fearless, and bring Balder from below? All stood in silent shame, save Hermod who spoke out, I am he who dared write and return with word. Why does no one know me? Why am I forgotten? Speaking so, he felt a pull, a tug, against his thigh, where hung the bag that held his stolen strand of weird. Unwound, unwove, unspun. By this sign he grew wise. Quick, courageous, clever, Hermuth became greater, learning what weavers know. No thread alone will bind, but must combine, drawing warp with weft to entwine. A single stolen thread is safe, but worthless then. It must risk shortening, with other threads tangling, whole only in patterns, making enmeshed meaning. With thought as swift as act, Rash Hermoth turned round, stridling Svither's stallion, his messenger sped down, ripping the road, racing to find the Norns anew. 
To their cold home he rode, soft and silent entering, punishment expected, redress earned for ill deeds, his future woven foul, if not at once snipped short. Within Nudden stood forward, not to indict nor greet. In silence stood Hermod, until, wiles and will fled, he called for consequence, announcing his own guilt. Here I am, thief of thread, faster than fate yet foiled, a fly off the web, but by its absence still bound. Sister spiders, descend, your prey returns, undone. Then did the three emerge, old earth, verdandi, and faceless skuld, last always. His three sides surrounding, ringing the self-damned rider, holding out empty hands. Knowing their meaning, he held hard for a heartbeat, then withdrew his life thread, placing it in the palm of grim verdandi, she who most offended seemed. Spider indeed, said she, stringing his skein onto life's short spines. What friendship did you find outside, untouched, untied? What lonely unbound pride? Stalwart Hermud stood strong, facing truth, not flinching. Without others joining, I could create nothing. They complete my pattern, as I bend theirs in turn. Turning to earth instead, accusing the crone incensed, You who grin, you design the boons we bear at birth, traits that earn attention, or lacking limit life. Cackling, she countered, Find not your fault in me, Odin's boy. Grateful be that you I spun at all. You Aesir are long work, and not what I prefer. I but spin, life to spawn, to birth it, but more blame the shearer or the sheep for fiber's final form. Your temper tends from there. I but wind what wool I find. Hermuth nodded, humbled, marking her meaning well. Having had answer, he turned to the third, sharp schooled, summoning his last nerve, demanding her defense. Oh. This final fight fault I find. You snip each strand too short, stealing stockpiled success, denying dreams deserved. Birth and being are boons, but why abide your blade? Mouthless but still mocking, the maiden made reply, More than wound or wasting, forgetfulness you fear. But who must remember one who lives forever? Value is unknown till done. An uncut blanket warms no bones. An infinite garment is worn by none. Lives, like threads, need endings to weigh their worth as holes. Thus rebuffed, their thief bowed, and bid, how do you judge? The raided hall was yours, but what I claimed was mine. What is the price to pay? Jotnar, will you end me? The ancient one laughed loud. The weaver even smiled, but the youngest bristled, and silence spoke for all. Here, then, is your humbling, torment and teaching, too. No unseen robber comes for us who hold weird's thread. We allowed what you dared. What occurred was ordained. What was we wove and yet unwinding, it wove us. Your stories are assigned, even those not told. Your fame is foreknown, yet you must earn every word. You must fret as if free, each decision doubted. He home, hasty Hermoth, and deliver your doom. Bring back Brother Balder, if his word that will be. Boast of your bravery, leaving silent this lapse. So saying, they unspooled the stolen skein again, setting it all a spin, resuming the story, resetting the traveler, returning thief to time. That is my story, Stolen Thread, about how 
Hermuth, the Aesir, the Norse god, stole his own weird, stole his thread of fate, and why he brought it back. For those who were around through it or came in and out, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I, obviously, I love it. There's not many of the poems that I put out that I dislike, um, but some have a special place, and that one I consider a, a great work, uh, a worth the effort. Oh, we're at last uh, after 7.30. Um, hello, by the way, for those who put in messages. I know I saw a couple, what the heck is this? Um, it is poetry, yes. And it is a story. Um, I count that as both a poem and a short story. It's longer than a short poem. I have a couple more pieces planned for tonight, and I will probably take the hour that I have planned. So if you're here, welcome. Stick around. Have some more entertainments. Um, here's now is a good place to uh, mention that I do accept requests as much as I can fulfill them. If you'd like to hear a song, a poem, a story, a piece about a particular character, if I have something what I call my, my paper file, um, I print out things to hold on to or to edit. Uh, do, 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 messages. Okay. Um, I try not to interrupt when I'm in the middle of something, but I you know, give a wave or a hi, but otherwise um, I'll change tracks in between. This next one's not super long. It's written as song lyrics, but I have not come up with a tune yet. So this is one of those things that I always hope that some, you know, idle musician will come along and hear it and go, oh, I want to use those lyrics in a song. So, hey, if that's you, great. Um, <laughs> if not, um, again, glad to see some folks coming in. This song, uh, you'll get the idea of pretty quickly, even from the title. It's called History is Stupid. And I'm just going to read it as, as a poem. Um, like I say, I'm still working on the actual music. Thank you for the likes. History is stupid. The times before we wrote things down were thought to be quite dim. People think we're smarter now than they were way back then. They didn't leave us records that could prove the theory wrong. I actually think history's been stupid all along. As soon as man rolled clay to stamp, we wrote of stupid things. A lot of dick and butt jokes, and some smug, self-righteous kings. Just pompous lies and propaganda scribed on parchment scrolls, and most of that dictated by some powerful assholes. All history is stupid, and the past was never great. We've never been much smarter than today. Yeah, sure, the present's stupid too, but don't let that be cause of you. Let's try to make the future less inane. Yes, Rome built roads and aqueducts to centralize control. For privileged few, the rest could screw, go die in war or toil. No one asked for Roman rule. Its glory was a joke. The plebeians were miserable till they threw off its yoke. Oh, monarchs never were divine, and certainly weren't right. Much of what made that age dark was all the goddamn knights. Chivalry was chauvinist, the church was overpowered. It took a thousand years of shit for Renaissance to flower. All history is stupid, and the past was never great. There's never, or there's always been some problem with our brain. Yeah, sure, the present's stupid too, but don't let that be cause of you. Let's try to make the future less depraved. The golden age of reason was a wave of colonization, as every petty privateer stole treasures for their nation. Explorers claimed to find new lands where folk already lived. To fix that nuisance, they just made the natives slaves or dead. The brutal age of industry paved way for automation, which could have ended hunger, but just fed the corporations. The First World War was called the Great War, but of course, it wasn't. It took near Armageddon just to finish up a second. All history is stupid, and the past was never great. The problem has been met, and it is us. Yeah, sure, the present's stupid too, but don't let that be cause of you. Let's try to make the future less screwed up. Now the wars are smaller, but they're just as idiotic. There's wars for culture, wars for terror, wars against narcotics. Hell, we'll fight wars for cola brands, we'll riot after games. At least the wars before us had some prize the winner gained. Today's the age of silicon, of worldwide internet. It doesn't seem more knowledge has made people smarter yet. If anything, we've found new ways stupidity can fester. 
Maybe they'll be smarter when the minds are artificial. All history is stupid, and the past was never great. Don't let the liars drag us back again. Yeah, sure, the present's stupid too, but don't let that be cause of you. Let's try to make the future worth the wait. Hello and welcome to those who came in at the tail end. That was a song in progress, a song without a tune called History is Stupid. <laughs> it's only sort of about your, your school subject of history, but hey, if you paid attention in social studies and world history class, yeah, there was a lot of dumb throughout human history. If you think things are dumb now, they were dumb then, and I'm sure they'll be dumb in the future. Let's try our best not to have it be that way. On that note, I have a story to finish things up for tonight. Again, unless there are any requests, anything that I need to tack on for my, for my audience. This story is a fable. There are animals in it, turtles. It is an allegory, like the story I shared on the last live. In other words, it's a story about something else. I won't say what it's about, Hopefully you figure it out along the way. And the title might make you think of another famous story. It's called The Turtle Stacks. By the way, I've also shared this in a slightly longer form on YouTube on my channel. So if you ever catch my link tree and you want to see some of the other stories, poems, songs, game reviews, um, specifically historic and um, culturally significant games. Rather than, rather than current games, I go way old school. Things like uh, old Egyptian uh, and Roman games. Anyway, let's get back to the story. The Turtle Stacks. This is a story about stacks of turtles. No, not that other famous story. Uh, but there are some similarities, and there are some differences. And the differences are important. Once upon a time, thank you, in a deep, dark forest, there were born many, many turtles, all hatched from the same clutch. Why their mother laid them there in that deep, deep, dark forest, we don't know, they don't know, but it's possible she wanted somewhere safe, somewhere quiet, sheltered by the many trees, with few predators. So the turtles grew up safely in the forest. They ate whatever they could find, which, because it was so dark, was mostly just a little moss and some mold and some mushrooms. It was all right when they were young, but as they grew and as they began, became adults, there was less and less food for everyone to share. Now the turtles started to wander farther and farther apart, seeking out more food. As they did, some of them smelled something a wonderful, sweet smell carried on the wind. Flowers and berries and lush greenery. They began to think that a better place must exist somewhere out there, but they couldn't be sure where it was. The wind whipping between the trees of the forest made it very hard to find a direction where this lovely food could be found. The turtles started to talk amongst themselves trying to find a way to get to that far-off place. Several of the turtles had a clever idea. And there's some new messages. Hold on. Okay. Just catching up a little bit. Sorry to pause the story. I promised I wouldn't do that too much. Turtles! Everything. Thank you. Okay. The turtles hit upon a smart idea. Let's climb up, up on each other's shells. We're turtles, we're steady, we're strong. We can stack up high enough to see above the trees, and we'll be able to see which way to go. A lot of the turtles agreed this was an excellent idea, but some of them did not. The disagreement, disagreeing turtles did not trust anyone to choose the right direction. They said the turtles on top of the stack will just get lazy, and the ones on the bottom would get tired and sore. They insisted every turtle has to find their own way and not rely on another to hold them up. 
Now those independent turtles, they went off into the forest, all in their different directions. And maybe some of them did find the meadow beyond, but a lot of them didn't. They starved and died in the deep forest. How do I know? The turtles sometimes found their old shells. But the cooperating turtles went ahead with their plan together. They stacked up, one on top of each other, until they had a pile tall enough to see over the tallest trees. The turtle that ended up on top shouted out directions. That way! No, keep going that way! And the stack began to move, powered by the turtles on the very bottom. Now this method worked well for some time, a few hours, until the bottom turtle started to get tired and complained. Sure, they could eat the moss and mushrooms and so forth on the ground, but not as much because they were moving. And it was heavy work carrying all those other turtles. But the turtle at the top shouted back down, No, I can see! It's not that far! Keep going! We're almost there! We can't stop! Except that the turtle on top had seen the leaves on the top of the trees and discovered they were tasty and good to eat. And some of the trees had flowers and fruit. And so the top turtle kept changing the direction to bring him over close to that lovely food. Occasionally it would shout at the bottom turtles to stop, take a break, and then it would eat whatever it found near, and then it would give new directions toward the next bit of food. The turtles kept going on like this, minute after minute, hour after hour, until the turtle started to complain again. Now the top turtle was starting to get full. It had plenty of leaves, so it started passing a few down the stack to the turtles just below it, and they'd eat some and pass a little bit down, but the leaves never made it to the very bottom of the stack. So now the turtles, a little higher up, a little closer to the top, were happier, and they called down lending their voice to the top turtles. No, no, we're going the right way. Stay at it. You're doing great. They also said, you know, why, why should we swap positions? It would just take more time and be more work. Let's just keep going as we are. When it became clear that nobody was going to budge from where they were, the bottommost turtle started moving again. Eventually, the bottom turtles were exhausted. They were able to eat, but the turtles just above them that were supporting most of the rest of the stack but weren't getting any food, they were fed up. And finally, they couldn't take it anymore. They heaved and shrugged, and the whole stack collapsed to the forest floor. There was a lot of anger and some injuries but eventually everybody paused to talk, to eat what they could, and to realize what had happened. That original top turtle was demoted to the very bottom. Everybody blamed him. It was his fault. And everyone agreed that no one should have to be a bottom turtle forever. There should be swapping, uh, so that every so often the bottom turtles got to be a little higher. Uh... And the turtles near the top needed to watch and criticize the topmost turtle. No more leaves for bribes. Eventually, they took a vote in a, in a huge act of trust. They chose a new top turtle. This was what everyone considered the most responsible, trustworthy, intelligent turtle they could find, rather than just whoever got up there at random the first time. They piled up once again, and the topmost turtle got above the trees, found the direction, sent them on their way. The stack started to move, and this time the top turtle indeed led them unfailingly on the right course. Except there was a new problem as they got further out. The forest floor was full of rocks and pits and streams and ravines and all kinds of obstacles, dangers that the bottom turtles would have to work around and avoid. At one point, the stack finally came to a ravine so deep and so wide and so steep, it couldn't be crossed. 
the bottommost turtles began to turn to the side, going at an angle from the path. What are you doing? cried the top turtle. That's not the right way. There's a hole down here, called the bottommost turtles, but the top turtle could barely hear them. We can't turn aside now, cried the top turtle. It'll take too long. Keep going forward. Now the turtles, near the top in the middle right then, couldn't see because the forest was so dark, and they agreed with the top turtle. He'd been leading them right so far. There was no reason to cha change direction if they could avoid it. Eventually, the bottom turtles stopped arguing and fighting. They just hoped that they could manage the incline. They tried very slowly to climb down, but they failed. They slipped, and near the bottom, the stack lost its balance and went tumbling down again. Again, there were injuries and arguments, blame, and a whole lot of wasted time. Turtles snapped at each other all over. Worse, down deep in the ravine, there was nothing there to eat. The turtles talked things over, much more quickly this time, and agreed it wasn't really the top turtle's fault. It had done its hardest and done what it thought was right. The problem, it was the middle turtles that hadn't listened to either side and hadn't communicated. They certainly hadn't supported the bottom turtles when they should have. The communication had to go both ways. And if a top turtle wouldn't listen to what it was being told, it had to be replaced. The turtles decided that not only the bottommost turtles needed to be swapped out every so often, but also the top turtle. No matter how talented and honest that top turtle was, they could always make mistakes. And swapping would teach the middle turtles about the needs of both ends. In fact, it might be best if they put a few extra turtles above the tops of the trees, a few more top turtles, so that they could all watch one another. The turtles stacked up once more, this time in less of a pyramid and more of a taller, thinner pile. More turtles above the trees, some somewhat fewer below. The top turtles did their absolute best to keep watch, both on the direction of travel and on the other top turtles to make sure they weren't uh, misbehaving or not paying attention. The middle turtles did their very best to relay messages in either direction and to weigh what they were hearing from the top and the bottom. They argued a lot more, though, than they had before. The stack kept having to pause to wait, to swap out turtles, to decide on directions. Still, the process was seeming like a reasonable compromise to avoid the problems that had tumbled them before. They found that all the swapping actually was pretty exhausting, and it took a long time to pull turtles from the top down to the bottom all the way. So in practical terms, they started just switching the top turtles with the upper top middle, and the lower turtles with the middle bottom. That seemed like a balance between fairness and efficiency. Eventually, though, all of the turtles toward the bottom were tired. They weren't getting enough food now, they weren't getting much rest, and they were still having to balance the majority of the turtles above them, especially because the stack had gotten so tall. Finally, everyone's energy just gave out, and rather than collapse the stack, they agreed to stop and separate. At this point, the turtles were nearly exhausted, too tired even to argue much. They were starving. They felt like they were starting to die, all of their work and all of their travel had only gotten them a little closer to the promised meadow. Many of the uh, remaining turtles began to wonder if the original dissenters had been right. Maybe this stacking business was a terrible idea. A few more of the turtles wandered off on their own. And I think most of them probably died too. There were not, almost not enough turtles left to even make a stack that could reach above the trees. Finally, one turtle proposed a brilliant idea. It said, Wait, look, the meadow isn't going anywhere, right? It's always in the same direction. We all want to get there. I mean, sure we do. And 
it's sometimes hard to navigate, but why are we always walking while we're stacked up? Yeah, there are obstacles to avoid, so we get thrown off track. But when that happens, we could stack up again just for a few minutes, get our bearings, and then separate and keep going. And if a turtle is tired, they could climb up on me. And like, if I'm tired, I'd hope I could climb on one of you for a little while. But we don't need to have a turtle above the trees all the time. There was more arguing, finally. And some turtles were afraid that, left on their own, separated, not stacked up, they might get lost or hurt. Some turtle asked what would happen if the directions were bad from one of the times they stacked up. Say the top turtle was nearsighted or just stupid. They'd just waste more time. And there were some turtles who just really didn't want to trust or carry one ever again. They were just sticking around because it seemed safer than wandering off on their own. Look, you can all do what you want, said the turtle with the idea. I can't make you do anything. This just seems like the best plan anyone's had yet. Look, it does avoid the problems we had before. And the best thing is, if this plan doesn't work, we could pause and change it rather than continuing on for a long time with a mistake. That seemed like a fair enough argument. The remaining turtles agreed that they would try, and if they thought it was going badly, they'd stop and reorganize. They were all tired and hungry and angry. But while they didn't have a lot of time to spare on a mistake, they also didn't have much time to spare arguing. The turtle stacked up once more, just for a couple minutes. The top turtle found the meadow and called out the new directions. And then the turtles unstacked and started walking in that direction for as far as they could go without confusing, losing their bearings. Some turtles did carry others that were too tired. Some turtles guided others who had gotten the directions confused. Some turtles refused to help anyone and only walked by themselves. When most of the turtles didn't know where to go, or some turtles started to wander too far away, the group called out to one another, gathered up, and stacked up again. Not for too long, just long enough to get new directions. The turtles kept going, and some of them did starve on the way. Hence, a few turtles decided they didn't like this plan anymore, but they couldn't convince the others to stop, so they continued on, or they wandered off on their own, as it goes. And then what happened? Did they all starve to death in the forest? Did they make it to the promised meadow? Was there ever really a meadow to find, or were they being deceived? I can't answer that. The turtles are still walking. They still stack up. Sometimes they fall back into one of those old foolish plans and go walking long distances in the big stack. Sooner or later, they do fall down again. They know better, but every so often, some bastard of a turtle lies and threatens and manages to scare them back into it. Still, I have hopes that if they stick to their plan, the, the best plan, that last plan, the often difficult and uncertain plan, the plan that requires every turtle to help and trust another, at least for a little while, they might just make it out. And maybe they'll see past that meadow to the beautiful mountain beyond, or a lake where other turtles dwell, where the berries are plentiful and the predators fewer. Who knows? We can hope. That's the end question mark. So I, I see some people went over yeah, story has nine hundred endings. Yes. Technically it has one ending. But uh that's many billions of years off, right? As I said, this is an allegory, and as in most fables, the turtles are not actually turtles, and the stack is not actually a stack, and the forest is not actually a forest. The meadow might actually be a meadow, if you believe in Elysium. No. Um uh, 
I see some people commenting, why don't we show the pictures? I'm curious, uh, Copernicus 33, I don't know what pictures you're referring to. I did have some graphics that were on the YouTube video for turtle stacks, uh, but I don't know of any others. You know, and I should have had a turtle with me, not a living one necessarily. Uh, I bought a spider today, a stone spider, as a gift for Anansi, because I'm storytelling. And I always want to give a nice offering to Anansi when I tell some of his stories. Uh, but I didn't get a turtle. I should have. Build a rocket. Ha ha. Can I meow? Yes, I am able to meow. That is true. Your story needs illustrations. Oh, no, I agree. Um, illustrated stories, stories with images are always better. Um... The other turtle story about stacks of turtles that I'm referring to is Yurtle the Turtle, which has some fascinating illustrations. Uh, my stacks would look a little different. Turtles probably would too. Um, I love having artists draw. Oh, something I can talk about real briefly um, for those of you who are still around and, and don't mind listening. I'm finishing a book soon. It is a ghost written book. The idea is not mine. The art is not mine, but the writing is mine. I made it into a book uh, for the original creator. It's called Guardian Fighters Era. Uh, we'll be putting that out hopefully early next year. Uh, we're actually in the final proofreading and looking over the publishing drafts. That has lots of illustrations. The artist uh, is an excellent graphic novel, uh, light novel, manga style uh, type of thing. Uh, Socrates Mota is the artist, and that book has almost a hundred illustrations. It is a light novel, uh, and we're going to be doing a whole series, probably between four and five books. So just the first one is finally getting out in print. That's what I've been doing with my writing time most of the past couple of years, other than poetry, short stories. That's the only long book I've written. Um, that's what I have planned for tonight. Again, uh, bundle of sticks. Hmm. Am I a librarian? No, this is just my, my bookshelves. No, I thought about it as a career, but I wanted to get into something else. And there's, yeah. Oh, bundle of sticks! Oh, that one! Yeah, it's a tripod. I lashed together sticks to, uh, actually, if you go back and look at one of my videos, the Elder Futhark Primer... It got use in there. I was going to say, I didn't have them up here. I have a bundle of hawthorn twigs that I just put downstairs. But no, these are willow branches. And it's a tripod easel. So I use that to hold up signs for a Comic-Con where I was presenting, selling my books, uh, games. I make card games, strategy card games, one that's based on OEM, the Irish writing system, one that I'm finishing up now, again, hopefully early next year, called Everybody Will Die, which is a game about death and trying not to die as long as you can. So that uh, tripod was part of my booth decor. Let's see. I think... Since there's some folks on and, and uh, talking, I want to throw in one more piece. At least. I've got two, actually, here. Oh! This is another one I put on YouTube, but it's too long for TikTok. Um, it just happened to be on my stack here to put away. I'll throw you out one more thing. So this is more mythology, but this is not a new myth. This is not a made-up booth decor. Booth decor. Oh, ha! Okay. Yes, booth decor. Decorations for my booth. Not the team that uh, stages a birthday, I guess. Uh, so this poem that's just sitting here, uh, I haven't given anything for Hermes in a while. So this one is called The Wraths of Hermes. And this is a great one, especially because I was wrong when I started it. I started writing a poem about how generally Hermes doesn't kill people. There's not a lot of smiting. And then I read about the things he does do to his enemies and those who disrespect him. Yes. 
uh, is my is my pagan patron, so to speak, and um, kind of the guide. Is the one that pushed me to do live shows, to get on TikTok, to put work out there and not just put it in books to sell. So, the Wraths of Hermes, what I have learned. I once began a song about the lack of Hermes' wrath, how unlike most he rarely raised his ire. For never had I heard of mortals tortured by his hand, or cities leveled by his anger's ire. Fire. Ha. But just a moment's research into classic mythic tales soon disabused me of my foolish theme. The god of speed had enemies and dealt with them quite well, just through some subtler, more poetic means. The elder who betrayed him after infant Hermes' crime and gave Apollo lead to find his herd? The trickster tracked him down, asked him, so you like dropping dimes? Then changed him to a herm to end his words. A princess called Agraulos also met a matching fate, transformed by Hermes into common rock. She wanted paid before she'd let her sister go on dates, and Zeus's son does not like being blocked. Another meddler tried to tattle on the god of thieves. He warned the guardian Argos of a plot. But Hera's cow was stolen and her giant put to sleep, and Hermes changed loud Hyrax to a hawk. That's only one of several mortar, mortals Hermes turns to birds. Another was a mighty king of Kos. For mocking the Olympians, his daughters were transformed, then raven's wings for squawking Eumelos. Agron was a mouthy prince and Eumelos's son, who cursed the god and called him common thief. Hermes might have spared him had he not scorned all the gods. He woke up with a plover's tiny beak. Agrius and Aureus offended all the gods by eating every guest beneath their roof. Hermes caught those ursine twins with brother Ares' aid and gave them wings, their nurse and mother, too. Rocks and birds, though favorites, are certainly not all, and mortals weren't the only things he changed. A mountain nymph named Chelone got herself a turtle shell for missing Zeus and Hera's wedding day. Now, here's the best in terms of wrath and one that I had missed, a village that did Zeus and Hermes harsh. Every door in Lydia but one was closed to guests. They drowned the whole town in a mucky marsh. So, though he doesn't kill as much or level continents, Hermes has his wrathful moments too. He just prefers to use some more creative punishments and make offenders serve some better use. Hope you enjoyed that. Like I say, that was one of my favorites so far of the offering poems for Hermes, just because it's got history, it's got humor, it's got a good warning not to mess with the gods, especially the Greek gods. They do not appreciate disrespect. <laughs> it's always a fine line to tread with Hermes, too, is you can joke, you can laugh, but don't treat him like, you know, a mortal buddy or, uh, a fool. All right. I don't feel like I'm quite done. And I see some people. The little bear, big bear. You know, I don't think that specifically has to do with the Dippers, uh, the, the Ursa constellations. I think that's more of a Roman myth. But hey, my point of view with new myths is especially if that makes sense to you, if you like it, go with it. Um, I just noticed according to that particular myth, he turned them into birds, but who knows where those birds ended up. Oh. All right. Last one I wanted to share because it was on the stack and it's one I'm thinking of re-recording. This was the first thing I ever shared when I started Bardic Study with the Druidic Order. It was just, hey, I'm going to write a song and I've had these lyrics rattling around in my head. I'm going to try to hit the pitches properly, because that's part of it. I wish I had it memorized. That, that would be perfect. But just one more thing to share, because, I, because I, again, I love it. Hopefully you'll enjoy those who, are, those who are with me. 
Uh, this song is called Without Love. And I don't think I've ever posted it on, on YouTube. I think I've just shared it with the Bardic group, with the study group. Without Love. You could write a pretty poem. It's just fancy words without love. Or you could build yourself a home. It's just bricks and wood without love. You could bake the perfect pie. It's just calories without love. And you could labor all your life. You're just passing days without love. Without love, no, nothing matters. Without love, why even bother? Money, pleasure, power, fame. I trade them all for love. Without love, you're half alive. Without love, you're wasting time. While earning love is powerful, you've got to make your own. You've got to make your own. You could walk to take a hike. It's just dirt and trees without love. And you could strive to climb the heights. It's just rocks and breeze without love. You can go and see a show. It's just lights and noise without love. Or you could drive from coast to coast. You're just burning oil without love. Without love, no, nothing matters. Without love, why even bother? Money, pleasure, power, fame. I trade them all for love. Without love, you're half alive. Without love, you're wasting time. While seeking love is beautiful, you've got to find your own. You can call to set a date. It's just a contact without love. And you can try to find a mate. It's just a contract without love. You can start a family. It's just breeding kin without love. Or you could pay to just get laid. It's just rubbing skin without love. Without love, no, nothing matters. Without love, why even bother? Money, pleasure, power, fame. I trade them all for love. Without love, you're half alive. Without love, you're wasting time. While getting love is pleasurable, you've got to give your own. You can vote for candidates. It's just power games without love. And you can be the president. You're just ducking lame without love. You can pray to any god. It's just empty talk without love. A church or shrine or synagogue is just an old box without love. Without love, no, nothing matters. Without love, why even bother? Money, pleasure, power, fame. I trade them all for love. Without love, you're half alive. Without love, you're wasting time. While being loved is powerful, you've got to be your own. Without love, no, nothing matters. Without love, why even bother? Money, power, pleasure, fame. I trade them all for love. Without love, you're half alive. Without love, you're wasting time. While gathering love is bountiful, you've got to grow your own. And with that, it looks like I successfully chased off everybody who was listening before. That is... It's power. It's not the kind of power I wanted, but... I saw a few more people come in. Uh, welcome to you as well. Let's think Playboy Cargo. I don't know that one. I could look it up. <laughs> You'll notice that my songs tend to have a particular uh, theme and, and habit to them. Um, so, it might be out of my range. I do well with uh, Leonard Cohen, Nick Cave. Um, yeah. Actually, I apologize, uh, G Money. I appreciate requests, uh, but I don't think I can do that one tonight. But thank you. Uh, I'm going to be signing off shortly here. Uh, let me see, did I miss any comments? Do some Drake. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I admit to ignorance. Um, I've heard a few of his songs, but boy, I can't sing them. Oh, I have to look up lyrics too. I always say, I always say I'm a, I'm a lyricist. I'm a writer. I'm not a musician. 
So I, I try to sing things. But unfortunately, yeah, not my channel. I'm sorry. All right. I think that's going to be it for tonight. Uh, thank you again to everybody who's still here or who came in. I'm sorry it's a bit late. I started at 7, and usually I run about an hour. Uh, I will be back again come probably the new year, early January. I'll certainly be posting things on TikTok, uh, little bits and pieces. And yeah, um, for those who haven't seen it, check out my YouTube channel. Uh, there's a lot of material that gets posted there. All of it original. Uh, that's that's part of the thing. Do I like books? Oh, I love books. Yeah, you know. Besides besides this collection, um, I write books. I like to read them. I love the concept. I think books are what made us intelligent, sentient beings. How many books do I have? I can't even guess. Um, in addition to these, there's actually three shelves going across. There's a book, shelf of pagan books. There's the shelf next to my bed that's the things yet to be read. There's a good couple dozen there. And then there's that many more down in the basement in storage. So if I had to guess, I'd say it's probably several hundred, five, six hundred that I still have, that I haven't given away or traded. My favorite book. I know that one. Okay, there we go. There's a question I can answer. There's an author named Richard Bach. Um, most people know him from a book called Jonathan Livingston Siegel, which is excellent, and I like it. But my favorite of his books, I think it's right up here on the shelf. Yep, there it is. I won't say he's my favorite author of all time, but the book itself... So this is Jonathan Livingston Seagull, for those who may have seen it before. Another version. But this book, it's backwards, of course, because of the camera. Illusions, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah. This is still my favorite book. Why? Because I still follow its advice on a regular basis. Um, Richard Bach was a positivist and a very spiritual writer. So that sometimes puts people off. Not quite Christian, but definitely leaning that way. Very messianic. But, Illusions, it's about the adventures of a reluctant messiah. Uh, it is a little sacrilegious. It is a little spiritual. And it gives advice. There's actually a book, the manual the character has, of how to become a messiah. And it gives little anecdotes. Things like, the original sin is to limit the is, or God. Don't. Constantly, and I've written poems about it. I hear about people saying, God is this, God is that, God can't do this. You're literally telling God what it can't do. Don't. Don't put limits on deity, God or gods or, or whatever divine you look into. Um, let's see. There's a version of a proverb uh, those who argue for their limitations are proven right. A good, another good one to bear in your mind. Um, if you've ever seen a poem called Desiderata by Max Ehrman, that's another one of similar flavor and feeling, is it gives guidance, really practical guidance, almost like the flavor of Zen Cohen's, um, rather than fancy, idealistic sort of things. So that's my favorite book of all time. Now, second favorite and favorite author most of the time, Terry Pratchett. Um, and particularly the book Small Gods, for similar reasons. If you haven't read it, please do. I hope you enjoy if, if you read it on my advice. But uh, Small Gods is about, it's literally a new myth. It's about a god re-emerging who's lost followers and worshipers and finds one that brings him back into the world. Um... There's a very good anime I can recommend. It's got a, some similar theme. But, but Small Gods is Terry Pratchett, so it's humorous. It's set in a fantasy world. Um, and there's a lot of allegory and things that are actually more related to our current world. Um, but it gives an idea of religion that I've not found elsewhere and that I really appreciate it. And it's stuck with me as a seeker and as a pagan. So I highly recommend that one. That'd be my, my second favorite. Um, Obviously, it's a, you know, thank you for the question. That's, that's one I can go off on for quite a while. <laughs> um, hey, if anybody else has suggestions, by the way, like I say, I may not stick around too much longer on this live, but on future ones, if you want to suggest things I should be reading, always looking for ideas. I know I've got a, quite a stack. 
What am I reading right now? A book about the history and uh, culture of yeast, because I got interested in baking. A book on poetic meter, that's my Bardic Studies work uh, I'm still working on. It's called, um, let's see, I can't remember. It's something like um, the meter is the fun of the thing or something like that. And it's about how poems are constructed, the internal structure. It's helped guide me toward making things a little more rhythmic and fluid. Um, the idea of internal beats within a line. And I think that's it right now, other than the occasional magazine articles, the oak leaves, uh, newsletter stuff. But it's slow going when you're writing, trying to read other things. Um, I don't do nearly as much new reading as I used to uh, even 10 years ago because when I've got that free time available, I'm usually working on something, writing, designing cards for a game, um, throwing poetry on TikTok. Uh, I just started up this project. So it's something that I miss having the time for, like I think everybody does as they get older and get into the working world. Oh, I see more people joining and that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> Again, usual start time is about 6.37 when I do lives, and I like to do a lot of original stuff, a lot of short work at the beginning. So if you don't get in right at the beginning, don't sweat it. When these record properly by TikTok, the last one did not record correctly, hopefully this one will. Uh, when they do, I put them up to my YouTube channel. It's not quite video on demand type stuff, but it's uh, similar. Hello, Zedepina. Yes, hello. All right. Better get going. At some point, I'm supposed to settle down toward bed. Um, as I said at the beginning of the show, it's been a heck of a day. We were driving around, ended up with a flat tire, got that fixed, got back home. Just had a few minutes to spare before I started this live. So ah, I could use a shower. It was raining. I could use a time, some time to breathe. Thank you, everyone. Once again, I appreciate folks coming in. I wonder if I... Uh... Hi, Matthew. Yes. I have 1 million followers. No, I do not. I mean, bring them on. I'm aiming for 100,000 if I can. Um, but maybe I'll start starting my shows a little bit later if this is more the time people can come in. That'd be awesome. Okay, I'm going to stop promising and threatening. Boop. And good night, everybody.